Uh, you should have a full shalom sech shach al Yisrael. Amen. So in this week's parasha, we have uh, Man Torah, the giving of the Torah, the Sarah says, the Ten Commandments. Now, what's interesting is, is that after that whole experience of, uh, of our Sinai, the Ten Commandments, so Hashem, it says in Pasuk, Yom Hashem Maisha, that Hashem says to Maisha, He has a few other mitzvahs to mention. It's like, He almost made it, you know. The Pasuk says, uh, Hashem says to Maisha, Leisas in iti, Yelohu Ketzef, Yelohu Hezav, Leisas Lechem. That we're forbidden from fashioning idols of gold or silver. Okay. And then it goes on, Mizbach Adom Atasili, that Hashem also then instructs that when you build an altar, you know, to bring sacrifices in the temple, in the Mishkan, Besamikdash, it should be made of earth, Mizbach Adom Atasili. Okay, so a few questions. First of all, again, what does this have to do with Harsinai? Again, the, the, the Ten Commandments, obviously those are pretty big mitzvahs. And so why is Hashem, right after Mayur Harsinai, giving us these specific additional mitzvahs? As almost to say, these are the runner-ups. Like, what exactly? What's going on over here exactly? Why specifically are these the mitzvahs chosen to be given to us right after such an experience of the Ten Commandments? And also, just in general, these mitzvahs that are sort of again mentioned right away, which are not to fashion idols of gold or silver, and when you build an altar, make it out of earth. Like, what is? What do those have to do with each other? What do those have to do with each other? I understand. Maybe you want to tell me the, the mitzvah of not building, not fashioning idols of gold and silver. That's pretty big. Okay, so maybe it didn't make it to the Ten Commandments, but it's pretty important not to fashion idols. I get it. Okay, fine. But then this idea that when you build an altar, it should be made of earth. Why is that so important? It seems to be just a, a, a small detail in terms of building the base of Mikdash. That when you build an altar, by the way, it should be made of, uh, of Adam, of earth. Why is that significant? Okay, right, so <clears throat> that's question number one. Another question we have to think about is, in the beginning of the parsha, when Hashem sort of introduces His plan of giving the Jewish people the Torah, so Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu that Moshe has to tell us, you know, what the plan is that we're going to receive the Torah, and what is, and what is the Torah going to do? Like, what is that? How is that going to change us? What's what's Hashem's mission for the Jewish people? So it says in Pasuk that Hashem, Hashem's plan for us is that we should become Mamleches Kaihanim v'Gai Kadosh, a, a nation of priests. Mamlechas Kayanim, a nation of priests. Now here's the question. A priest, a Kayan, by his very definition, demands that there has to be someone that's not a Kayan. Right? I mean, if everyone's special, then no one's special, right? So what exactly does it mean that we're going to be a Mamlechas Kayanim, an entire nation of priests? Well, if, if everyone is a priest, if everyone is, you know, it, it, you know, to have a hierarchy, to have someone at the top of the food chain, that means that there has to be people in the bottom of the food chain. If everyone's on the top, then guess what? Everyone, you know, th there's no one special there. So what exactly does it mean, Mamlechas Kahanim, that we're all going to be priests? First of all, we're not. I mean, you have Kahanim, Levim, and Yisraelim. So what does that mean, Bechla? <clears throat> okay, so, I'll share with you an idea. This is something that we find in the Meish The Meish was was um, one of the great Hasidic masters. He lived in uh, the mid-1800s. He was uh, a colleague of the Kotzka Rebbe. He was from Pshischa, that, that base measure. And he writes the following thing. Going back to the, one of the first questions we had, which is, why after the Ten Commandments does Hashem give us some random mitzvahs? Again, not to fashion idols of gold and silver. And, may, and when you make a, an altar, make it out of earth. So listen to what he says. He says, Eloi Kesef, we know that again, everything the Torah tells us is not just laws that once upon a time apply. They're telling us something about ourselves right now. And so what's the significance of those mitzvahs being told to us right after Aser Sedivus? So he says like this, a low cast of gods of silver. What does that mean? It means, It means that Hashem is telling us that you just heard the Ten Commandments. You just saw unbelievable things, right? And you therefore have a picture of what a religious Jew should look like, what a God-fearing Jew should look like. Now Hashem is warning the Jewish people, though, I want to make sure that don't make idols, don't make, you know, uh, uh, don't make uh, statues of gold and, gold and silver, meaning silver, the word kesef, also comes from the word kisufen, which means love and longing and desire. And Hashem is saying that, of course, you experience Harsina, and therefore you see that there's an ideal, which is called loving God. But don't fake it, don't be fake. Aloy Kesav don't make it don't make a, a molten image of silver, meaning Ahava Vislav is love and excitement in Yiddishka, Yoisim Bikafim Amadecha, that's more than where you're actually holding. That's called an idol, that's called fake, that's 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 not really you. 
Kein chavrusa kalp vishmaya. Said the Ishbitzer, you're not buddies with God. It's not like you could fake. You, know, you could fake a friend. You could, you know, you could pretend uh, to be someone that you're not with a friend. But with God, God knows the truth. And if a person's not authentic, and you're not being you, you're not being real, then that's cool. And and you're just putting on a show of being all in love and excited with Yiddishkeit. Then guess what? That's called a god of silver. That's a molten image. It's a it's a dead piece of silver. It's not real. Hashem loves a Jew because of one's honesty. That's an important thing in Yiddishkeit. That's that's what it means, a god of silver. Eloi Kasef. What does it mean, Eloi Zav, god of gold? Zav, again, we find in this form, if silver is, is, is it comes from the word kisufin, which means love and desire and closeness, Zahav, gold, always means gavur. It means restraint. It means holding back. A sense of fear. A sense of fear. Hainu, that means, Yiru Yosem Mikvim Also, don't put on a show as if you're in awe of God when you don't really feel it. Be authentic, be real. Whatever love you feel, that's what you should express. Whatever fear, whatever awe you feel, that's what you should express. But to have a person who feels one way, but just puts on a show of something else, that's called, that's called a god of silver and a god of gold. And that says the Israelites are how the Pasuk then continues on, that when you build an altar, made it of, make it of earth. What does that mean? Mizbach Adama Tasli, make an altar of earth. Hainu, Pshitus, which means simplicity. What is earth? Earth means whatever it is. Earth means nothing special, nothing uh, expensive, just plain and simple earth. Whatever it is in your heart, if that's what you're feeling, it's called earth, then that's the mizbech, that's the altar I want. That's what he says. That's what he says. In other words, again, what the Ishbitzer is saying is that this is why those three mitzvahs are given to us after Aser Sedibris, because after the Ten Commandments, after such an experience, one might feel, one might think, that if I am not, you know, holding emotionally by that experience of Harsinai, quote unquote, then at least then I have to just... It, that, that's what Yiddishkeit looks like. That's what serving God looks like. And if I'm not feeling that, then I have to just fake it. Because that, that, that's what Yiddishkeit is. Hashem telling us these mitzvahs after Har Sinai is telling us something different, which is, of course that's an ideal. If you feel that excitement, then, then that's great. But that's not what Yiddishkeit is. What Yiddishkeit is, is being honest and real with yourself and expressing what you're going through at that time. If you feel like you're standing by Arsinai, then great. If you don't feel like you're standing in Arsinai, then 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 Mizbach Adomatasal, and then offer up to God an altar made of earth. If it's not gold and silver, then at least make it of earth, as long as it's authentic and it's real. That's the Ishbitzer says. Okay. Now here the, this is something we have to though we have to investigate a little bit further, because this by itself, like all extremes, no extremes are, are good. You know what I mean? So this is an extreme. This idea of not faking it at all, right? Of whatever it is that you're feeling, whatever, whatever it is that you're holding by, if it's Harsinai, then great. And if it's an altar of earth, then that's what God wants of you. But never at all to put on a show. Never, never at all to put on, you know, uh, uh, to pretend to be something that you're not. But what about the idea of, like, emulating holy Jews? What about the idea of, of even having a, ch- having a child, right? So how do you raise a child like this? So, you know, kids, you know, you bring a kid to shul, whatever the case may be, right? And the kid doesn't know what he's doing. But as parents, we train them, right? So you sort of, what are you doing? You're teaching your child to go through the motions. Because the kid's not holding by anything yet. The kid, uh, you know, is holding the, the bench upside down, you know what I mean? Like, the, the kid doesn't know what he's doing. And yet, that's what we do as parents. That's what we're supposed to be doing as parents. Obviously, when the kid gets old enough, you have to explain and to give them the tools and the confidence to be honest with themselves. But until that point, you got to just... You know, you, you fake it. You know, what I mean, and you emu- and and you emulate things that are and uh, things that you want to be. So, how do we make sense of that? So it's like this. You know, that the mizbeach and the Beis Hamikdash was was interesting. The altar, the pasuk says, it has to be made of earth, right? But it's interesting. It was made of earth, but it actually had a covering of bronze. It had a covering of bronze. Now, why is that? What is the significance of that? The answer is like this. The Yisroetzer is not telling us what Hashem is saying is not. That if you, if you're to only be, you know, only express what you're feeling, and not, you know, uh, incorporate within yourself anything else. What 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 the Israelites what Hashem is telling us is the following thing, which is that each and every one of us we have like an essential personality. Everyone has their own personality, their own headspace, their own experiences, their own, you know, their own uh, universe. 
And everyone has that. Everyone has their universe. So you have two people, right? So uh, person A has his universe, and where he is right now, he's not feeling it much. He's not feeling much. He has his own personality and his own stuff, he's not feeling much. And then you have a person next to him who's like, you know, also being authentic, but that guy, his authenticity is that he's standing by Arsina, you know, he's very, very excited. What the Yishmets are saying is that what you should not do is to literally just pretend as if you're that guy. That's not what God wants. God wants you to be authentic and to be real and to, and if, and to present your, your Mizbeach of earth to God. But, with that being said, to learn from other people and to incorporate their strengths and their perspective into your perspective and into your little universe, that's fantastic. There's, there's a, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Everyone has what to offer. Everyone has their own perspective and everyone has what to offer. And every single Jew has to learn from everyone else. But the idea is never to mimic and to copy everyone else. The idea is to take, to, to understand who that person is to learn from that person and to see what could I learn from that person and how could I incorporate his qualities into my life. I'm not mimicking him. I'm not pretending to be him. But I'm trying to learn from him. I'll give you an example. You know, there's a Gemara, there's a Gemara in Bamitsia. The Gemara says a fantastic story. The Gemara says that, uh, I'm sure you've heard of Rava, right? Rava was the great Amor in the Gemara. The Gemara says that Rava, every, every uh, I think, every Arab Shabbos, mm -hmm. there would be a Basque, a heavenly voice came out to say a good Shabbos, to wish Rava a good Shabbos. That's pretty good. Now Rava, that's, that's good. The Rava's walking around. Uh, you know, I get a good Shabbos from God every week. That's great. But then Rava realizes, he finds out, that there's another Jew in his town that gets not every Arab Shabbos a good Shabbos. Every single day, there's a heavenly voice that comes out to wish this guy a Shalom Aleichem like a good morning. So I was like, that's pretty good. Who is this person? So the Gemara says this person was not a Moira, he was not a Tana, you know, he was not a Chosh of a Talmud Chacham. His name was Abba Omna. He was a doctor. Abba Omna. Omna means doctor. Dr. Abba, that was his name. And so Rava said, like, this guy, you know, what is he doing to merit a Shalom Aleichem every single day? Now, keep in mind, by the way, the doctor probably didn't hear this heavenly voice. You know what I mean? So it could be we're having uh, Shalom Aleichem too. But uh, Rava knew that this guy was getting a Shalom Aleichem. What was Abu Omna? What was so special then? The Gemara says about Abu Omna, this is what he did that was unique. What was unique about Abu Omna was, is that he had a certain policies in his practice. Policy number one, a separate waiting room for men and women. Everyone should be comfortable. Policy number two, maybe you've had this when you go to the hospital or something, you know, Chaz Vashalm, everything, everything should be well, but they have like, let's say a person goes to the surgery, whatever it is, they have these gowns that are very awkward, Behind the back, and you know, uh, your feet are exposed, legs, and even the back part, you know. So he had special gowns for the women that they should feel comfortable. That's practice number two. Practice number three, says the Gemara, is that he had a thing that he would never ask people for payment. He had a special room, a side room, that his patients, before they would uh, come to see him, they would go to the side room and put down the money that they're supposed to put down. If someone couldn't afford it, then they just went in the room <laughs> and they came back out and no one knew. Those are his three practices. So Rava hears that and, Rava's, and Rava said to himself, that's very nice, that's a beautiful, you know, that's, that's very, very nice, but I'm Rava. <laughs> I mean, I'm Rava. I go down, in history, none of, none of us until this Gemara have ever heard of Abu Omna, but we've all heard of Rava. So you know what the Heavenly Voice said back to Rava? Rava said, uh, they said to Rava, Rava, you're Gavaldic, you're great. But you can't do what Abu Omna does. You can't do what he does. You're not a doctor. You're not put in that situation. That's not your that's not your environment. Your environment is learning and there's no one better at it than you. But his environment is being an honest doctor and there's no one that does it better than him. And so the idea is not that Rava should now so so now what's the next part? So Rava now quits his job as a Rosh Hashiva, becomes a doctor? No. What's the idea? The idea is that Rava stay in your lane. Abu Umna, stay in your lane, but you learn from each other. Rava, look at Abu Omna, see how much caring he has for his patients. So try to take that, learn that as a lesson, and apply it to your life. So you're not copying, you're not mimicking, you're not pretending to be someone that you're not. You're learning from other people, and you're trying to glean from them how to incorporate their, their unique perspectives and their, their, their points of greatness into your life. That's the idea. Rabbi Nachman Bresso said, this is the meaning of what Hashem said to the Jewish people, that my plan for you is that everyone should be priests. So he asked the question, how could everyone be on the top? If everyone's special, if everyone's the top of the food chain, then no one, then no one is. Like, 
that's, that's, that's where everyone is. The answer is the idea is not that everyone is special in the same way. <laughs> that's not, then you're right. It means that every single person stays in their lane. Every single person has their perspective, their peckle in life, their particular way of serving God, their authentic, their authentic altar of earth. And in their perspective, in their life, they have to be the top in that particular point. The same thing with Rava and this Dr. Ava. They each one have their own, each one of them you can look at as the top of the food chain. Rava was the top of the food chain in terms of learning, and Abba Umna was the top of the food chain in terms of, of caring and kindness and sensitivity to others. No? But, so in that way, the, the goal is, Hashem's plan is that we should all be the top of our food chains. But the point is that each person, that, you know, sort of excelling in their area and learning to incorporate the greatness of others into their perspective. That's the idea. And by the way, it's interesting, we find this, what's the, what's the last Pasuk that the Pasuk, that, that the Torah says, sort of right before it moves into the story of the Ten Commandments? So we know that right before the, the story of Esther Sedibris, the beginning of the Parsha, is the story of Yisra, right? What's Yisra? Who was Yisra? Yisra was Moshe's father-in-law, who was not Jewish. Not only was he not Jewish, he was the, 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 the Pope, you know what I mean? He was the high priest of, uh, of whatever the religion was in Midian. And he hears about what's going on in the Jewish people, and he decides to convert. This is great. That's great. That's, that's fantastic. So what happens? So he comes to Moshe Rabbeinu, they greet him, it's a whole party, it's very, very nice. And he sees what's going on. What's going on is that from morning to night, everyone's coming to Eshaos of Moshe Rabbeinu. And Yisro comes and says to Moshe, with all due respect, I have an Eitzah, I don't think this is, this is not going to last. You're going to be drained, it's not going to work. So I have an Eitzah, my Eitzah for you is, my advice is that you should set up a system of courts. You should set up uh, subordinates. And anyone has a, ring, uh, you know, a shayla about a piece of chicken, let them go to their rav. If the rav can't answer it, let him go to his rabbi. And eventually, you work up the line, you go to my rabbi. Okay. It says in Pasuk, the Yishma Maishla Kolchais night. That Moshe heard the advice, he listened to the advice of his father in law, and right after that, the giving of the Torah. Let's understand, what's Hashem telling us with that? Like, why is that the introduction? To the Ten Commandments. Understand that, by the way, according to many opinions, the story of Yisro happened after the giving of the Torah. So Hashem goes out of his way to put that before, so it's for a reason. So let's understand, who are the two people we're talking about? You have Moshe Rabbeinu and Yisro. So it's an amazing thing. Moshe Rabbeinu is in his 80s at this point, right? He just took the Jewish people out, he was 80 years old. And Moshe Rabbeinu was Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, 40 days, 40 nights, without eating, without drinking. There's no one greater than Moshe Rabbeinu. No one knows more. No one knows it, God more intimately. Punin the pun, face to face, he speaks to Hashem. And Hashem said later on to Aaron and Miriam, how are you not afraid of talking about Moshe Rabbeinu? Moshe Rabbeinu, even to say the words, the Pasuk says later on that when Moshe Rabbeinu came down from Sinai for the rest of his life, he literally had to have a veil over his face because the radiance over his face was so overwhelming for people to see. That's Moshe. And then you have Yisro. How much does Yisro know? He, he just converted. Yisro went to Yeshiva for one day. <laughs> went to Yeshiva for one day. What does he know? Not only, not, not only does he not know a lot, just in the, in, the, in the totem pole of society, I mean, you know, unfortunately, you know, he doesn't have much of a family. He's a convert. He doesn't have land. He doesn't have, you know, so in terms of, of his comfort level, of really, you know, uh, it, 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 he's not by the Mizrach of the Shul, you understand. He's in the back of the Shul. And Moshe is in the front of the shul. And then you have this guy, Yisro, who knows, he, he literally just started learning. And he comes, you know, it's like a guy who's like, you know, like, let's say a kid goes through high school completely uninterested in, you know, learning, whatever it is. And he goes to yeshiva and he's like three days in, right? Three days in. And after three days, he has like, you know, he learned like three lines of Gemara, right? And he goes to Rechaim Knievsky and he starts having a conversation with Rechaim Knievsky about like what the Pshan of the Gemara is. It's like, what are you... <laughs> what, what do you do? You don't know anything. With all that being said, Moshe Rabbeinu listens to Yisra and takes and takes his advice to heart. The Yishma Yisra, the Yishma Moshe Kolchais, and Moshe listened to the voice of his father-in-law because Moshe realized that's true. I have my lane, and in terms of of who I am, in terms of greatness of Torah and prophecy and all that, no one come close to me. But you know what? Yisra has something to offer as well. Yisro is his perspective. Yisro spent his whole time being the Pope, being the head of, of whatever religion there was in Midian. That means he, has, he knows how to, how, how to or, organizational skills he has. He knows how to do that. So what's, what's so wrong? So notice Moshe Rabbeinu recognized 
that he's a king, I'm a king in my zone, and he's a king in his zone. And so what's wrong with me listening to him and trying to incorporate some of his perspective and some of his greatness into my greatness? I'm not trying to not be Moshe to be Israel, just like Yisrael's not trying to not be Israel to be Moshe. But everyone learns from each other to incorporate their greatness into themselves. This is, going back, this is why it said that the Mizbeach, the altar, although it's made of earth, its, fund, its, its foundation is earth, but it's covered with, with precious metals. And the Yishmaster said the earth of the Mizbeach represents your authenticity, your honesty. And the idea being is that that's where everything starts from, but you're, once you have that as a solid foundation to incorporate other points of greatness that you see in other people into your perspective, that's the ideal. That's the goal. This is exactly why, again, the, to introduce us into Har Sinai, into what it, means to, what it takes to be a, a, a well-rounded Jew, is that lesson of Maish Rabbeinu, V'yishma Maish L'Kal that he knew who he was, he knew who Yisro was, and he was comfortable enough to recognize the greatness in Yisro and being able and try to incorporate that greatness into himself. That's authentic. This is not only true, by the way, not only when you see others, when you see greatness in others, but this is also true even when a person sees deficiency in others. How do you give, you know, like one of the mitzvahs of the Torah is to give rebuke, to give musr. So that's, you know, usually a dirty word. We don't like, we don't like giving musr, people don't like hearing musr, that's for sure true. You know why? Because more often than not, the way people give rebuke is that I, I don't recognize you're a king in your field. I see you as a nobody. I see you as a nothing, and I'm something, and I'm talking down to you. Well, in, in that way, for sure no one's going to like hearing that. <laughs> that's, not, that's not something that's productive. How does one give Musa properly? The way to give Musa properly, the way to give rebuke properly is out of love. What does that mean? It means that I recognize that, in, that you have an entire universe, that there's, an entire, there's literally an entire universe in your life. And I'm not trying to undermine that. I'm not trying to undermine that. I recognize that from, from where you are, you have your specific perspective and agenda and everything, and I'm not trying to destroy that. I'm just trying to give you something that you could learn from my perspective. That's all. I'm just trying to, the, the, from, I, have, I have a certain perspective, you have a certain perspective. I have, I, I'm a king in my field, you're a king in your field. I'm just trying to give you some advice how you can incorporate my greatness into yours. That's all. I'm not trying to redefine who you are. I'm just trying to give you some of those tools. And more than that, more than that, you know, the Svarm tell us that when a person, when you see someone doing something wrong, God forbid, or, or whatever, and, and you want to, you know, take the, the, the step of, of trying to help that person, you know, to overcome whatever obstacles there is, the idea is that you have to, you have to create an, an equality between you and the person. You can't see, you can't look down at that person. And therefore, it's actually recommended in this farm that before a person, you know, says something, you know, to try to rebuke another Jew or to give someone sort of like, you know, you, you should do better, you have to find that same flow within yourself. To say, find that same flow within yourself. That's why there's a story with the Baal Shem Tov that this, this, this happened all the time with him. The Baal Shem Tov once saw a Jew who was not keeping Shabbos properly, and the Baal Shem Tov wanted to say something. But the Baal would never say anything to another Jew about what they have to work on until he saw that same issue in, his, in himself. And so the Baal spent a lot of time figuring out, like, what's wrong with my Shabbos? And the Baal really couldn't find anything wrong with his Shabbos. So what he, what he did at the end was, it, 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 he found the Zayar. The Zayar, the Zayar says that a Talmud Chacham, a Torah scholar, is called Shabbos. Just like Shabbos is a day in the week, in terms of, of people, a Torah scholar is called Shabbos. And Baal Shem Tov therefore investigated himself and realized that he could do better in terms of respecting and honoring Torah scholars. So once he recognized that there was something in his life that he can work, that he should work on in terms of Shabbos, now he was comfortable to talk to that guy about his Shabbos. Because again, the idea is never to, to, to talk down at another Jew. The idea is to recognize that we're all kings. We all have the potential of being kings in our, in our, in our space. The idea is just sharing our kingship with others. That's the idea of sharing what makes us great with other people, not to not to make carbon copies of ourselves. It's never the idea. The idea is to just give people some of those tools to be able to incorporate your unique greatness into them, and that's the idea. That's the idea. That's Hashem's plan for us. The ideal is 
we should all be literally kings, a nation of all kings. And the way that happens is by everyone recognizing and being honest and being authentic with who they are and learning from others how to incorporate other people's authenticity into their own. Right. Yes, Thank you, Hashem. Thank you.